Section 40 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 40, Selected Poems by William Collins. William Collins, 1721 to 1759. There is much to inspire regretful sympathy in the short life of William Collins. He was born at Chichester and received his education at Winchester College and at Magdalen College, Oxford. A delicate, bookish boy, he had every stimulus toward a literary career. With a fine appreciation of beauty in all forms of art and a natural talent for versification, he wrote poems of much promise when very young. His Persian Eclogues appeared when he was only seventeen. Then Collins showed his impatient spirit and fickleness of purpose by deserting his work at Oxford and going to London with the intention of authorship. His head was full of brilliant schemes. Too full, for with him, as with most people, conception was always easier than execution. But finding it far more difficult to win fame than he anticipated, he had not courage to persevere, and fell into dissipated, extravagant ways, which soon exhausted his small means. In 1746, he published The Odes, Descriptive and Allegorical, his most characteristic work. They were never widely read, and it took the public some time to appreciate their lyric fervor, their exquisite imagery, and their musical verse. In spite of occasional obscurities induced by careless treatment, they are among the finest of English odes. His love for nature and sympathy with its calmer aspects is very marked. Speaking of the Ode to Evening, Hazlitt says that the sounds steal slowly over the ear like the gradual coming of evening itself. According to Swinburne, the odes do not contain a single false note. Its grace and vigor, its vivid and pliant dexterity of touch, he says of the Ode to the Passions, are worthy of their long inheritance of praise. But the inheritance did not come at once, although Collins has always received generous praise from fellow poets. His mortified self-love resented lack of success. With a legacy bequeathed him by an uncle, he bought his book back from the publisher Millar, and the unsold impressions he burned in angry despair. Meantime, he went on planning works quite beyond his power of execution. He advertised proposals for a history of the revival of learning, which he never wrote. He began several tragedies, but his indolent genius would not advance beyond devising the plots. As he was always wasteful and dissipated, he was continually in debt. In spite of his unusual gifts, he had not the energy and self-control necessary for adequate literary expression. Dr. Johnson, who admired and tried to befriend him, found a bailiff prowling around the premises when he went to call. At his instigation, a bookseller advanced money to get Collins out of London, for which in return he was to translate Aristotle's poetics and to write a commentary. Probably he never fulfilled the agreement. Indeed, he had some excuse. A man doubtful of his dinners or trembling at a creditor is not disposed to abstract meditation or remote inquiries, comments Dr. Johnson. Collins was always weak of body and when still a young man was seized by mental disease. Weary months of despondency were succeeded by madness until he was, as Dr. Wharton describes it, with every spark of imagination extinguished, and with only the faint traces of memory and reason left. 
Then the unhappy poet was taken to Chichester and cared for by his sister. There, he who had loved music so passionately hated the cathedral organ in his madness, and when he heard it, howled in distress. Among the best examples of his verse, besides the poems already mentioned, are The Dirge to Cymbeline, Ode to Fear, and the Ode on the Poetical Character, which Hazlitt calls the best of all. How Sleep the Brave How sleep the brave who sink to rest by all their country's wishes blessed when spring with dewy fingers cold returns to deck their hallowed mould she there shall dress a sweeter sod than fancy's feet have ever trod by fairy hands their knell is rung by forms unseen their dirge is sung there honour comes a pilgrim grey to bless the turf that wraps their clay and freedom shall a while repair to dwell a weeping hermit there the passions when music heavenly maid was young while yet in early greece she sung the passions oft to hear her shell thronged around her magic cell exulting trembling raging fainting possessed beyond the muses painting by turns they felt the glowing mind disturbed delighted raised refined till once to said when all were fired filled with fury rapt inspired from the supporting myrtles round they snatched her instruments of sound and as they oft had heard apart sweet lessons of her forceful art each for madness ruled the hour would prove his own expressive power first fear his hand it skill to try amid the cords bewildered laid and back recoiled he knew not why e'en at the sound himself had made next anger rushed his eyes on fire and lightnings owned his secret strings in one rude clash he struck the lyre and swept with hurried hand the strings with woeful measures wan despair low solemn sounds his grief beguiled a sullen strange and mingled air twas sad by fits by starts twas wild but thou o oh hope with eye so fair what was thy delighted measure still it whispered promised pleasure and bade the lovely scenes at distant tale still would her touch the strain prolong and from the rocks the wood the vale she called on echo still through all the song and where her sweetest theme she chose a soft responsive voice was heard at every close and hope enchanted smiled and waved her golden hair and longer had she sung but with a frown revenge impatient rose he threw his blood-stained sword and thunder down and with a withering look the war denouncing trumpet took and blew a blast so loud and dread where ne'er prophetic sounds so full of woe and ever and anon he beat the doubling drum with furious heat and though sometimes each dreary pause between dejected pity at his side her soul subduing voice applied yet still he kept his wild unaltered mien while each strained ball of sight seemed bursting from his head thy numbers jealousy to naught were fixed sad proof of thy distressful state of differing themes the varying song was mixed and now it courted love now raving called on hate with eyes upraised as one inspired pale melancholy sat retired and from her wild sequestered seat in notes by distance made more sweet poured through the mellow horn her pensive soul and dashing soft from rocks around bubbling runnels join the sound through glades and glooms the mingled pleasure stole or o'er some haunted streams with fond delay round and holy calm diffusing love of peace and lonely musing and hollow murmurs died away but oh how altered was its sprightlier tone when cheerfulness 
a nymph of healthiest hue her bow across her shoulders flung her buskins gemmed with morning dew blue an inspiring air that dale and thicket rung the hunter's call to fawn and dryad known the oak crowned sisters and their chaste eyed queen satyrs and sylvan boys were seen peeping from forth their alleys green brown exercise rejoiced to hear and sport leapt up and seized his beechen spear last came joy's ecstatic trial he with viny crown advancing first to the lively pipe his hand addressed but soon he saw the brisk awakening vile whose sweet entrancing voice he loved the best they would have thought who heard the strain they saw in tempe's veil her native maids amidst the festal sounding shades to some unwearied minstrel dancing while as his flying fingers kissed the strings love framed with mirth a gay fantastic round loose were her tresses seen her zone unbound and he amidst his frolic play as if he would the charming air repay shook thousand odors from his dewy wings o oh, music sphere descended maid friend of pleasure wisdom's aid why goddess why to us denied layest thou thy ancient lyre aside as in that loved athenian bower you learned in all commanding power thy mimic soul o oh, nymph endeared can well recall what then it heard where is that native simple heart devote to virtue fancy art arise as in that elder time warm energetic chaste sublime thy wonders and that godlike age fill thy recording sister's page to said and i believe the tale thy humblest reed could more prevail had more of strength diviner rage than all which charms this laggard age e'en all at once together found cecilia's mingled world of sound o oh, bid our vain endeavors cease revive the just designs of greece return in all thy simple state confirm the tales her sons relate to evening if aught of oaten stop or pastoral song may hope chaste eve to soothe thy modest ear like thy own solemn springs thy springs and dying gales o nymph reserved while now the bright-haired sun sits in yon western tent whose cloudy skirts with breed ethereal wove or hang his wavy bed now air is hushed save where the weak-eyed bat with a short shrill shriek flits by on leathern wing or where the beetle winds his small but sullen horn as oft he rises midst the twilight path against the pilgrim born in heedless hum now teach me maid composed to breathe some softened strain whose numbers stealing through thy darkening veil may not unseemly with its stillness suit as musing slow i hail thy genial loved return for when thy folding star arising shows his paly circlet at his warning lamp the fragrant hours and elves who slept in buds the day and many a nymph who wreathes her brows with sedge and sheds the freshening dew and lovelier still the pensive pleasure sweet prepare thy shadowy ear then let me rove some wild and healthy scene or find some ruin midst its dreary dells whose walls more awful nod by thy religious gleams or if chill blustering winds or driving rain prevent my willing feet be mine the hut that from the mountain's side views wilds and swelling floods and hamlets brown in dim discovered spires and hears their simple bell and marks o'er all the dewy fingers draw the gradual dusky veil while spring shall pour his showers as oft he want and bathe thy breathing tresses meekest eve 
while summer loves to sport beneath thy lingering light while sallow autumn fills thy lap with leaves or winter yelling through the troublous air affrights thy shrinking train and rudely rends thy robes so long regardful of thy quiet rule shall fancy friendship science smiling peace thy gentlest influence own and love thy favorite name ode on the death of thompson in yonder grave a druid lies where slowly winds the stealing wave the year's best sweets shall duteous rise to deck its poet's sylvan grave in yon deep bed of whispering reeds his airy harp shall now be laid that he whose heart in sorrow bleeds may love through life the soothing shade then maids and youth shall linger here and while it sounds at distant swell shall sadly seem in pity's ear to hear the woodland pilgrims knell remembrance oft shall haunt the shore when thames in summer wreaths is dressed and oft suspend the dashing oar to bid his gentle spirit rest and oft is ease and health retire to breezy lawn or forest steep the friend shall view yon whitening spire and mid the varied landscape weep but thou who ownst that earthly bed ah what will every dirge avail or tears which love and pity shed that mourn beneath the gliding sail yet lives there one whose heedless eye shall scorn thy pale shrine glimmering near with him sweet bard may fancy die and joy desert the blooming year but thou lorn stream whose sullen tide no sedge crowned sisters now attend now waft me from the green hill's side whose cold turf hides the buried friend and see the fairy valleys fade dun night has veiled the solemn view yet once again dear parted shade meek nature's child again adieu the genial meads assigned to bless thy life shall mourn thy early doom their hinds and shepherd girls shall dress with simple hands thy rural tomb long long thy stone and pointed clay shall melt the musing Briton's eyes o vales and wild woods shall he say in yonder grave your druid lies end of section forty